I get out of bed and I ignore them in the crate until I've gone and put on a cup of coffee. If I don't have to, I don't like to feed my dogs the moment I get out of bed. Dogs are great at predicting. So he was poking the alarm clock. Things get a little bit tricky. When I have a new puppy, I put an extra hour into my morning. That's exactly what we're talking about today on the podcast. Welcome back to McCann Dogs. I swear that my dogs, when they were younger, could hear my eyelids open. I think there's a tiny little noise, like a little noise when your eyelid opens, because all of a sudden I would open my eye and there's a dog right there. Yeah. Like, I think they heard my eyelid open. So I actually have a theory about that. Uh And I do some specific training surrounding that just to avoid falling prey to this theory. The eyelid opening? So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it very well might be the eyelid goes. Right. But basically what I want my puppies to do and my dogs to do is wait until I let them out to start stirring. I don't right. want my puppy going, oh, I heard Shannon roll over in the bed. So it right. must be time to get up. Yep. Let's get up. So I actually make a point of once I know my puppy is over the stage of having to bust first thing in the morning, right. you know, once I've, I feel like they've settled in enough, they're able mm-hmm. to hold it enough. I will actually make a point of, I get out of bed and I ignore them in the crate until right. I've gone and put on a cup of coffee or gone to the bathroom myself, or maybe had a quick shower or something right. like that. Or gone to work and come back. <laughs> <laughs> gone no. to work, yeah. built a house. You know. No, but basically my right. goal is right. that yes. I want my puppy to say, okay, I need to generalize this noise and right. I'm not waiting for you to just flip over in bed in the middle of the night to right. think, like, oh, it's time to get right. up. Yes. Good I'm thinking. waiting until you actually open the great door to let right. me out. So it just helps them build patience. Mm. And yes. initially it's, you know, I go to the bathroom first and then I come and let them out. And then as I know they're more and more capable of mm-hmm. holding it and being comfortable in their crate, I'll make it longer and longer until it's, you know, sort of randomized. Right. So it's yes. never any like huge duration of right. time, but enough that I know the puppy has not built any triggers saying that's the thing that's going to wake me up. I'm paying attention to that specific thing every day. And then, of course, they wake you up. Right, yes. (laughs) Because they get to sleep all day while we're at work. And if I don't have to, now a lot of times it doesn't work out, but if I don't have to, I don't like to feed my dogs the moment I get out of bed either. Because then there's Uh an expectation. (laughs) It's like the moment we wake up, within two minutes I'm eating. And most dogs are so food driven that that's a a big factor that they want to hurry you to get up because they want to eat. So um, I've... You know, if I can, I try to, no, we'll eat in an hour. Like, let me get all my stuff done and then I'll feed you. So they're not, you know, staring at my face in the morning. Absolutely. Hoping for breakfast. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, most of us don't get up out of bed and immediately head to the trough and start right, yeah. eating. <laughs> so our puppies could last a little right, bit as yes, well. Yes. It's good to not have like, uh, especially for those of us who really rely on routines. I'm really like, I like routine. I mm-hmm. like order. I know you're a little bit more chaotic and you're, you can roll with the punches a little bit better. And like, I'm very, I, I admire that quality so much in people because mm-hmm. I'm like, I'm very routine and I'm very structured and that works against me in some points of dog training because dogs are great at predicting behavior if we give them, if Mm -hmm. we give them the ability to predict that behavior by having routines in place. Right. Yes, Lots I of stuff to talk about surrounding that in the morning one, routine, actually. Right. And I, something to add, one of my parents' border collies put it together that the alarm clock is what makes my parents get up. And my dad woke up one morning a bit early because there was a weird noise and he could see it was about five minutes before the alarm went off and he could see their border collie Cody banging the alarm clock with his (laughs) nose. So Cody had put it together that it's this that makes them get up. Oh my God. So he was poking the alarm clock, seeing if he could. They're so brilliant. eh? Like Cody was a very smart dog, like exceptionally smart. But uh, I thought, wow, like. That's very, a really neat story. Very intuitive. I love yes. that story. Yeah. Yes. I love that story. That is so intelligent on mm-hmm. the dog's part. Oh my goodness. So let's talk a little bit about the actual routine of getting out of bed in the morning. So I like to make my dogs wait patiently mm-hmm. just a little while before any of those things. And my adult dogs now, I do the same thing. You know, mm-hmm. I get up, I let them out for a pee. I don't go to feed them right away. Right. You know, I don't make it about them right away. I want them to just settle until I'm at the point where I am ready Mm -hmm. to feed them and I am ready to do that activity. So um, I think that when we have a puppy, some of those rules tend to go a little bit out the window. Right. So 
I think that that's because people are getting up, getting mm-hmm. ready for work, and they need to do something with the dog before they go to work. Right. So here is where things get a little bit tricky, and people will often have to rush through this, and then they're putting away a puppy for the day or for the for the first four hours mm-hmm. of the day or whatever it happens to be who hasn't necessarily had their needs met. And right. that, of course, can cause frustration on the dog's part, mm-hmm. noise in the crate, accidents potentially in the crate, mm-hmm. you know, just pent-up energy, naughty right. behavior. Yes. You know, if my puppy goes away in the crate and they're full of energy Mm -hmm. and then they spend a few hours in the crate and then they get out of the crate, that excited, overstimulated energy is going to probably result in some bad behaviors. Right. So if I can get ahead of that Mm -hmm. and I can create a scenario where my puppy is content and then they can go away in the crate and they can relax and enjoy those four hours of rest. Mm -hmm. And then when they come out, their energy is nice and even and we can repeat it again. We can do something nice with Mm -hmm. them to work on mental and physical and all of that stuff. And then we can go from there. Mm -hmm. So now we might have to put them back in the crate for the afternoon, for example. Right. And it can be even more chaotic when you have young children too. Yeah. So you wake up in the morning and you have, you know, maybe a two-year-old, a four-year-old, and you have to deal with them and they like being the center of attention when they wake up. (laughs) But you also have a puppy who wants to be the center of attention. You may have a spouse that wants to be the center of attention too. (laughs) (laughs) I'm going to teach that spouse all sorts of great ways of playing with the kids. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. You almost have to have a plan. Yeah. In the morning, when I have a new puppy... I like to cut everything to the wire, but when I have a new puppy, I can't. Yeah. I have to get up an hour. I put an extra hour into my morning. That's what I was going to ask. Yes. So what do you do in terms of routine when you have that new puppy? So an extra hour. All right. Right. I give myself a a good extra hour uh, when I have a puppy. I'm sure some people right now who have to get up already at 6 a.m., which may be early for some people. I personally, I'm like, oh, six. Yeah. That's lunchtime for you. Yeah. 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 (laughs) I'm usually up between four and five. Like that's very normal for Mm -hmm. me. So I'm lucky that I would have lots of extra time to pad in the morning and it wouldn't be an issue, which works very well for me and my routine. But if you're not a morning person, you know, that extra hour, right. That sounds awful, but it's hard, but you have to do it. Now puppies, tend to not be able to, they can't sleep in as well anyways when they're brand new because their, their bladders haven't been conditioned to hold their, hold themselves all night. So anyways, you're, you're getting up with them at a half decent early time and you're, you're going to put in some training time, some play time. You're going to work with them. So they're mentally tired and a little bit physically tired as well. When you put them down, then you can turn your full attention to getting the kids ready, getting yourself ready, you know, doing what you need to do in the morning. Yeah. And this won't be forever. No, it's not forever. It'll be for a short period of time until your puppy has started to grow up a little bit, but you know, they have these needs Mm -hmm. and we just, we need to make sure that those needs are met for them and that when we put them away in their crate, they can settle and relax and have a rest. So there's a couple of things that, um, I know we all do with our young puppies to make sure that they go in there and they are chill. So I just want to break down a little bit. You talked about, um, you talked about doing some training and doing some playing and whatnot. So what might that look like for you? Well, first thing I'm going to get them out to the bathroom. And so, and, and going out to the bathroom is training. Yes. You know, we're going to do a little bit of training. I might, I might lure them using food so they don't pull on the leash to head out, um, you know, we're working on teaching them to go to the bathroom on command. So uh, while they're in the act of peeing, I'm saying, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. So that's a little bit of training. Um, if the puppy's been successful, I might, you know, maybe we'll do a little bit of training in the yard, response to name, or maybe we'll do a little bit investigating or running around in the yard. You know, then we'll come in. And then at that point, uh, my puppy's hungry. It's a great time to do some training. Yeah. So they're hungry. They're raring to go. They have all that energy. So now's the perfect time to work on a little bit of their skills that I'm teaching them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's really important to talk about the fact that you are not just opening the door and pushing the puppy out and closing the door and going to make your coffee and hoping that the puppy is out there peeing and pooing like you are expecting. And there's no skunk out there. That too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So- here's the thing with that morning routine as tempting as it is to just open the door throw the dog out and let them do their thing and assume that they're doing it they're not mature enough at that point to self-regulate it right. they're going to go out in the yard they may or may not pee right you know they might chase a leaf over here they might chase a leaf over mm-hmm. there they might sit at the door mm-hmm. and say hey where did you go i don't want to be out here all alone right. they might 
chase a squirrel. They might, you know, fence run. They might do all sorts of things right. that don't include going exactly. to the bathroom. Just like children. You know, yeah. you, you don't put a three-year-old in the bathroom and close the door and, you know, when Throw they come that out. child out the Yeah, yard when they come the out, you, did you go to the bathroom? <laughs> oh, yeah, did. Mm-hmm. But, you know, chances are maybe they didn't. They, oh, yeah, you're putting on the snowsuit. Did you go to the bathroom? Yep. And then yep. you zip up the last mm-hmm. piece. Yep. I got to go to the bathroom. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so right. everyone knows so, that. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone yeah. And that pup, scene. puppies are the same. You, yes. you know, just because you put them outside doesn't mean they went. Yeah. Going outside with your puppy is the only way you can guarantee they've actually gone to the bathroom right. and that they have voided their bladder. They voided their bowels. They're ready to go now a right. few hours in the crate, potentially, without needing to go to the bathroom. So that's such an important thing. Yes. You know, and just ch- checking too, like maybe they have loose stool. Maybe the yeah. night before you trained with a different treat. Uh, you know, you get up in the morning, all of a sudden it's like, oh, you know, there's loose stool. Like, okay, now my day's plans maybe have changed if my puppy's got a bit of the runs. So, yeah. you know, just being aware of things like that too by going outdoors with them. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny, Ned had some diarrhea last week. Mm-hmm. So we were into the vet, had a prescription of mitron- metronidazole. I'm not sure what the, he they did his fecal and there was no parasites present or anything like that. Um, it was that pepperoni pizza but, he ordered. Yeah, yep. it must be. <laughs> I don't know what it was. I think he probably had some sort of an intestinal infe- infection, but at any rate, it's cleared up now and his poops were beautiful all weekend. And I had to resist the urge to take pictures and oh, send them I, to you, all my friends. I was like, mm-hmm. The Blue Shirt Channel has to see Ned's poop. No, Shannon, nobody (laughs) wants to see Ned's poop. Anyways, I I would have put a smiley face on it. I would have emojied a little smiley face. Uh, Or a fly. Is there a fly emoji? I would have put the little fly. You would have been my best supporter. Yes, yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anyway, I refrained from, but honestly, right. you know, that feeling of elation when you're right. like, okay, it's, it's cleared over. up. They're yes. better now. I feel so good and I need to share it with the world. Uh-huh. But I keep it to myself. I did tell a few people, but I kept it to myself in terms of visual aids. (laughs) So anyways, I think that's a really excellent point, though. Knowing what their stool is like, knowing, verifying that they've gone to the bathroom. Right, yes. And And where they're going, too. So my child doesn't run out later and step in it and then track it through the house. Yeah, good Mm -hmm. point. Good point, for sure. But that gives you verification that now you can come in the house and you know that you can now, okay, if you want to make your coffee, maybe you put a baby gate up in the kitchen and you put your puppy down on the floor and you're watching them a bit while you're making your coffee. Right. And this is a great opportunity, too, to do some training with your puppy. We actually put out a video, it was a while ago now, where I basically just put a teapot on the stove and said, I'm going to train this puppy until that teapot Boy, like the whistle happens, right? right? Until a watch kettle ready. never boils. <laughs> I don't make watch tea, so I don't know boils. any of the proper terminology. But anyways, <laughs> it was one of those kettle, kettles that sat on the stove and went and whistles when it was finally ready. That was more of a beep than a whistle. It was more of a. <laughs> I can't whistle very well. We need better <laughs> sound effects yes, because we our, need the whistling kettle. <laughs> <laughs> made up sound effects are not good. Um, so, anyways, and literally, it was eight minutes. So that time that that kettle sat on the stove. Oh, that's a long time. Yeah, like and ended then up he, boiling and then went off was eight minutes. And I was able to train in that eight minutes. Right? I'm pretty sure it was eight minutes. I was able to train all sorts of things in that eight minutes. And right? like nothing really, like nothing really massive, but we did some tugging out. We did some trick training. Right, yeah. We did some stuff. Right. And basically this, the goal of stuff yeah. is to, first off, help stimulate my puppy mentally and mm-hmm. build some skills, mm-hmm. but it's also to drain some energy. Right. Right. Yes. So if I am, for example, if I'm just doing skills training, mm-hmm. I'm probably not going to drain the physical energy from my dog. And if I'm just doing energy stuff like tugging, retrieving, etc., cetera, mm-hmm. I'm not going to drain the mental energy out of my puppy. Right. But if I do a mixture of all those mm-hmm. things, that's a really nice way of draining both mental and physical. And that's right. important. A lot of the times people think it's just about the mental. Right. And that could not be further from the truth. Or sorry. Just about the physical. Just that's about what the I was physical. wondering. Yeah. yeah. That's right. what I meant to say. It's a good thing you're in my head and you can read my mind. Um, right. A yep. lot of times people go to the running. Oh, I need to tire the puppy out. So I'm going to throw this ball 20 times and then the puppy's going to be exhausted. But physically, they're exhausted. Right. Mentally, they're still got they've still got lots of energy in reserve right exactly mm. and it's like if you look at the dog's heritage uh you know a dog out herding has to use their brain to control those sheep so they are doing physical exercise but they're also doing mental exercise absolutely um us i remember watching my uh sight town uh, my saluki cowboy chasing squirrels and even though she's running she's also trying to predict 
where that squirrel's going yes. next. And it was amazing sometimes to watch her suddenly veer off what seemed to be the right course. And then she was right. The squirrel did go that way. So her brain is also thinking at the uh, same time, where's the squirrel going to go? So where's its trajectory? So dogs are used to having physical and mental exercise. Yeah. So we're doing them a disservice by ignoring the mental part. Yeah. Absolutely. And that mental part is what is going to help them just turn off completely and relax as well. Right. You really need a good balance of the two. Mm-hmm. And I actually just realized that I wanted to talk about when we were talking about the puppy outside going to the bathroom, mm-hmm. I wanted to talk about something that surprises a lot of people. When we say, when your puppy pees, do not feed them for peeing. A lot of people get surprised by that. Mm-hmm. Have you heard that before? I've heard that. Yes. 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 Um, We actually had a video that we put out that uh, we talked about that. Don't feed your puppy for peeing outside. And we got several questions Mm -hmm. saying like, really? Did you just say that? Why wouldn't I feed my puppy for peeing outside? Here's the thing. We just talked about a whole bunch of predictability factors with Mm -hmm. dogs, right? So what do you think will happen if I go outside with my puppy, they kind of run out into the yard and squat to pee, and then I give them a cookie for that? They're going to say, this is a pretty fun way to get a cookie. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. They're going to jump the gun on that piece. Mm-hmm. So they're going to run out. I've seen puppies learn this so quickly. And the handlers go, I don't understand why he runs out and like squats, but then he doesn't really do anything. And then he comes running back to me. Well, it's because he's anticipating getting a cookie. Right. Yeah. You know, dogs look for value. Mm-hmm. And when they see where the value comes from, they put connections together so quickly and they chain those behaviors. So if you feed your puppy for peeing, first off, it's not necessary because when they pee, it's already self-rewarding, right? right? If you think about yourself, when you have to go, it feels, it doesn't feel good, right? right? You've got pressure. You've got Mm -hmm. this, this feeling in your midsection and the puppies are the same way. So when they have a chance to alleviate that pressure, it's already a self-rewarding behavior for them. So that in and of itself is enough to say you did a good job peeing in the yard, resist the urge to actually feed your puppy. for So you don't keep a pizza in your bathroom and every time you pee, eat a slice. (gasps) (laughs) What a good idea. Maybe a little thing of chocolates though, because I don't want to spend too much time in the bathroom. I (laughs) I, I have to admit when, when I toilet trained my son, I remember <laughs> I, when he just started going and like letting us know, and then we go to the toilet, there was, I think like M&Ms or Smarties <laughs> or something, and he could have one or Jujube or something. Aww. Yeah, I do admit I did that with my well, child. And I think that's probably, uh, that's children, probably why a lot of people think they should right, do the yes. same thing with their puppies, right? Mm. So you know what? I'm glad you said that because it never even would have uh, occurred to me right. that we might do this with human children. I have my niece and nephew, but I really didn't have to didn't have be to, involved yeah. in but their, it, it just their shows, house training. <laughs> yeah, that, that there is a difference. Like children and dogs, like they're different. Huge. They, oh, they don't, massive. Yeah, yeah. The, a dog's an animal and a child's a human. So we can do different things with a human than we can do with a puppy. Exactly. And there's a lot of times where we will use human references to sort of make a point and illustrate a point, Mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that they are the same at all. They're very, very different creatures. So keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. We want to treat our... Treat our dogs in ways that make sense to dogs. Right, yes. And treat our kids in ways that'll make sense to our kids, of to course. Humans, yes. Of course, yes. absolutely. So um, now we're back in the house. We're making our coffee. We're doing a little bit of training mm-hmm. while we're making our coffee. And then maybe I'm going to feed my puppy at this point. Mm-hmm. What does that look like to you when you have a puppy in your house? The feeding process. The feeding process. Well, I'm, I'm going to start off with uh, a few kibbles. I'm going to basically do some a little bit of training in that with. Mm-hmm. So then the rest of the kibbles will go in the bowl and generally I put the puppy back in their crate to eat. Okay. So they're going to go in their crate. I'm going to close the door. They're going to finish their breakfast. Why is that important in the crate? In the crate? Eating in the crate. Well, it creates a positive association. It's like, you know what? My crate's a good place. Mm -hmm. It has value. There's food in this crate. So the puppy's like, I love going in here and eating. So we're going to put the puppy in the crate. I might put a a toy in there too, depending on my schedule, because maybe while the puppy is finishing up their food, I might be running off to have my shower. Right. So it's kind of a good little time there. The puppy can settle a little bit, let the food get down inside them while I'm having my shower. Perfect. Yeah. And I love that idea. I I always try to use their meals for multiple purposes because you can only feed a puppy so much, right? We use a lot of food in our training because it helps us show the dog what we want from them. It's an easy currency for most puppies. It is wonderful to be able to teach lessons with most of the food that comes to them. 
But having said that, we can only give them so much, right? right? I yes. don't want to overfeed my no. puppy. And this is a this is a valid concern mm-hmm. a lot of people have when we talk about training using food is I don't want my puppy to be fat. I don't want my, my puppy to be reliant on food, et cetera. And as long as you are not stagnating in the same process nonstop with food. And as long as you, like, we always talk about the entry level point of things. We don't necessarily talk about how we progress with those things and give you the full picture, but trust us when we say when we're using food and training, that is the jumping off point. That's the teaching point. That's mm-hmm. the reinforcement point. But we do wean away from the food yes. as the dog and the puppy learns mm-hmm. what's expected of them, et cetera. So there's a process to all of this. But food use is so beneficial because we have it at our disposal, right? Right. So I like to use a lot of my, my um, dog's kibble meals. There's a lot of times that I feed raw. When I have a puppy, mm-hmm. I will feed more kibble because it's easier to work with, right? right? Yes. Feeding raw in training. It, not, yeah, that would be a bit gross. It's, no, it's right. not as fun as it sounds. No, you know, <laughs> you'd almost have to almost put, it, oh, yeah. squish it up and put it in a syringe and yeah. yeah. No, and yeah. I'm not a purist when it comes to feeding like one specific thing. Anyways, mm-hmm. I like to mix, mix up everything. I'm cautious about combining, you know, uh, right. certain things with uh-huh. like raw with grain, et cetera. Mm-hmm. Obviously I'm cautious about combining those things, uh, which, in meaning that I don't, but, um, in terms of like one meal tomorrow being grain and your meals today being no grain and raw, Mm -hmm. like that's absolutely fine. Um, And I will do things like that if I know that I'm not going to be using the kibble, but I do like to use kibble when I have a puppy so that I have all the training opportunities and I'll do work on handling and I'll do work on um, food bowl exercises. These are huge. You know, teaching your puppy that it is fine for you to be around Mm -hmm. when they're eating is something that is quite easy to do with most puppies Mm -hmm. from a very young age. You know, there's the exception to the rule and, and possession is a very normal function of every dog. So if you have some, you know, possession issues that you're seeing, you definitely want to deal with it Mm -hmm. and you want to teach them better behaviors and better reactions and better emotional Mm -hmm. um, connections to you approaching while they're eating. Mm -hmm. But, um, and there's also that fine line between pestering your puppy. Yeah. Oh, huge. Yes. We, we, Sometimes we'll get videos of people who are sticking their hand in their dog's bowl and you can see the dog becoming frustrated. And we always say, it's like, imagine you're out for a nice meal and the waiter comes over and keeps sticking their hand in your plate. Eventually you're going to say, okay, yeah, enough's enough. Well, and especially if your instinct says, this is my food. And if I let someone near it, they're going to take it from me. That Mm -hmm. instinct being reinforced by you you know, annoying them basically right, while they're yes. eating is not good. So right. we talk about food bowl exercises and it's a very specific dedicated effort to say, okay, here's your food bowl and I'm going to put good things right. in I'm it. I'm not sticking right. my finger in it and swirling no. it around. I'm dropping things into exactly. it. Exactly. Yes. Please forget about the idea of trying to do these things just so you can do them. Mm-hmm. There needs to be a process. The, the idea of doing food bowl exercises is so that you can build something. You mm-hmm. can build comfort comfort with your dog being around their food and you being close to them while they're there. That doesn't include us petting them while they're eating. It doesn't include any of that stuff. Like, yes, we want to be able to, you know, accidentally brush up against the dog while they're eating and it's no big deal. Right. But I don't want to purposely set out to be petting and stroking my dog while they're eating. I might be able to get away with that when my dog is a puppy, Mm -hmm. but as they start to grow and they start to mature into those feelings of possession, it's actually going to work against me and it's going to put my dog in defense mode where he thinks I need to protect my food instead of him saying oh okay this is a pleasant thing Mm because you're petting me while while I'm eating and that's Mm -hmm. how we think about it as humans right but that is not how it works out so please don't think about I've actually written an article called um possession and how it fits in modern dogdom and you can Mm -hmm. find that on the McCann blog and it's um a really good breakdown of why possession happens and how it's very normal, but it is something that we need to address because it's not safe in our human world Mm -hmm. and different ways to address that as well. And I think I even broke down the food bowl exercises in that, that we do. So yeah, it's not just to be able to take away the bowl. We don't, we don't take away the bowl. No, you know, we don't reach in and take away the bowl because that would, that would condition the wrong response from the dog. The dog going, Hey, where's my food going? Right. Is not what I want to condition. I want to condition my dog going, Oh, here you come while I'm eating. What do you got? Right. You know, what are the good things that are coming out? And yeah, and so. not worried that, oh, what are they going to do now? Are yeah. they going to touch me? Are they going to stick their hand in? Like, yeah, yeah. It's, we just want them to say, oh, yeah, something yummy's coming. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Positive association right. work. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So that they anticipate good things. Yeah. That needs to be portrayed to your children, too, that when the yeah. dog's eating, Ooh, good let, the, let the dog eat. That's yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Which is a really nice reason to feed them in the crate if you have mm-hmm. young children that are a little bit unpredictable. Mm-hmm. You know, our kids probably want to get in there in the bowl and, and eat, eat a kibble. Yes. Yeah. yeah. They always, I remember my son was always very curious about what cowboy was eating yeah. when, when they were little and, or curious about what cowboy was sniffing. And, um, yeah. <laughs> Kids are very much monkey see, monkey do. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. So lots of really super important things that can come out of those meals. So we can create that positive association with the crate by feeding some of the meal in the crate. We can create uh, an opportunity to train with some of their kibble by feeding some of that kibble for training. Like there's a lot there, yes. you know, and, and we can certainly break it down and use it for all sorts of good things. So now I'm working mental, I'm working physical, because sometimes I might throw in some tug exercises yep. with the dog. Let's talk about tug for a second because okay. tug is something that often like I don't hear it as much anymore I'll, I'll, I'll be quite honest about mm-hmm. that it used to be a bigger a bigger fallacy out there right. that oh yes. teaching tug will make them aggressive right. oh yes. don't play tug aware with your dog you know right. and, and don't ever let them win right blah blah blah, blah, blah. all these mm-hmm. all these sort of old wives tales right and truly nothing could be further from the truth unless you let them play tug with no rules. Right. You know, mm-hmm. if there are rules surrounding the tug, it's a great training opportunity. Yes. So what are some of the rules that you find that are super important when it comes to tug? What are you conveying? Well, with tug, I always start the game mm-hmm. and I always end the game. Love that. So that's basically the the big rules for tug. The dog has to respect that, okay, we're beginning now and then has to respect that I'm saying enough's enough. Yeah. And it's a great opportunity to reinforce exactly those skills mm-hmm. because we can teach the dog to have some emotional control when that mm-hmm. toy comes out. We can teach the dog how to drop the toy on command using tug. We mm-hmm. can teach the dog how to sit politely waiting for that keyword, whatever it is, get it, take it, tug, right. yep. you know, whatever command you use. Mm-hmm. We can ask the dog to sit and wait politely until they hear that. And we can sort of proof through that as well. And I want to proof through that because I don't want to take a chance that my dog sees someone walking with something that looks really fun. You know, maybe there's, maybe there's a kid walking through my house with a toy that is theirs. Or a a scarf that looks like a fluttering toy. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. Ouch. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I wouldn't want that (laughs) melon hanging off your scarf. Right. Yes. (laughs) Help me, help me. So yeah, I mean, these are important rules to teach. It's important to teach the dog to be able to discern between a toy that is theirs and a toy that is not a toy that they, that we've invited them to Mm -hmm. play with versus something that we have not invited them to play with but still looks like a toy sort of thing Mm -hmm. all of those rules are so great surrounding tug and we get to get some of the puppy's energy out Mm -hmm. some of that physical energy gets to get drained as we teach them and as we have all these opportunities to fulfill their needs and get those these rules understood and then when we put them away in the crate again they're nice and relaxed Are you planning to bring home a new puppy and you're not sure where to start? Check out our puppy prep guide that will help you set up your puppy for success. One thing I always like to talk about though, and especially when it comes to sort of that frantic morning period where you're trying to get everything fulfilled so that you can get them in the crate and go away. Mm -hmm. Again, this routine thing can often work against us. So one thing that I like to make sure of when I put my puppy away in the crate is that I haven't just finished this wild training session right? If I do that, it's sort of like, I always say to people, you know, if you just came from the gym and you just had like this really busy workout session, what are the chances that you're going to be able to get in your car in the back seat and have a nap mm-hmm. after you walk at right. the gym? Yes. Like your adrenaline's up, you're mm-hmm. pumped. So I always like to have like a good 10 minute wind down mm-hmm. period where I'll just, you know, hang out with the puppy. And that may be when I work my handling stuff. That right. may be yeah. when I just snuggle with the puppy and mm-hmm. let them come down in energy. I don't want to go from that wild and crazy to putting them away in the crate right, right. away because mm-hmm. I don't think they have the skill yet to be able to transition between the two. That's right. later on down the road. It's yes. definitely a skill I expect from them later on down mm-hmm. the road. Don't get me wrong. But in the early stages, I just want to spend some time helping them drain that energy first, calm down a little bit, you know, come down from the marathon on high and then from there I can put them away in their crate with a chew toy do you right. what what do you leave with your dogs when you uh, the only two things I'll leave in a crate unsupervised are a Kong or a, a nylon bone perfect a, a hard nylon bone not a yeah. soft chewy one but a Good point. Uh, yeah. So there, there's the very pliable bendy ones. Mm-hmm. I mean, I would say past the point of 10 weeks old with puppies, I would not trust one of no. those with a puppy because they can work away at it and just swallow big chunks and yes. obviously not digestible. Right. Especially so. in their crate, they're, you know, they wake up, they're bored. Well, I'll just eat yeah. this. Yes. Yeah, for sure. So if, if you, if it doesn't hurt when you bang it on your knee, it's probably not good <laughs> to leave with the puppies. So, the, um, so come and, come and test out your nylon bones on Shannon's knee. There you it's go. an open invitation. Ha <laughs> ha 
Everybody. Shannon will sit out on a chair and you come and whack your bone on her knee. This is my new job. <laughs> <laughs> this is my new job. Oh my goodness. I'm going to uh, bring mine from home and try it out. <laughs> All right, I'm the same. I will, um, I'll do Kong's nylon bones. Right, love yeah. those things for the most part. Mm-hmm. I usually do want to make sure though that as my dogs, my puppies age, I keep an eye on it because even though yes. those things we usually say they're pretty safe for mm-hmm. all dogs, there are some dogs that you've you have I've a, mentioned. Yeah, I had you've I mentioned had a, Gavin, right? Yeah, I had a Cardigan Welsh Corgi um, named Gavin, and he could chew through a Kong, which is so. And funny. I've never had, and yeah. I've had Malinois, and they're voracious chewers, but. This little corgi could get, just had the technique to get yeah. through a Kong. Yeah. And it's reinforcing for them to rip things apart, mm. right? This is a fun activity for dogs. So their goal when they're chewing a lot of the times is just to decimate whatever that thing is. Right. And once they figure out the tactic to do so, yeah. they will be able to return to that, which I'm sure is what happened with Gavin. Right. He figured yep. it he out. figured it out. And, and then it was like, game on. Yeah. Let's do this. I'll multiple, destroy every and Kong. Yeah, it wasn't just a, a faulty Kong. He did it multiple times. Unreal. Oh. So yeah, that's a dog that, sorry, you're not getting a Kong left in your crate because nope. it's... It potentially could be a danger right. to yep. you. So. And they're very expensive for him to yeah, yeah. chew up and replace. Absolutely. So like I usually, I, I'm i not knock on wood. I have yet to have a dog. Even Quincy, the Rottweiler, she couldn't no, go I've, through a I, home. I don't know she if I've heard technique. of. <laughs> I don't know. It, it was amazing to me. Absolutely yeah. amazing. Now he was, you know, Cardigan Welsh Corgis are a big dog on short legs. Yeah. Like he was a very powerful dog. No but doubt. He must have, I don't know. Yeah. He was just very good at it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He was yeah. special. He figured yeah, he it out. He must have just figured ing, ing, yeah. ing, ing, with his teeth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, technique is technique. Mm-hmm. He yep. got good. Yeah. Um, so once I put my puppy away in the crate, here's another place where I am really careful not to create routine. A lot of the times we create our own separation related stress or separation anxiety by being very routine. You know, if I just pop my puppy away in the crate and then go and pick up my keys and put on my coat and open the door and leave, pretty soon my puppy is going to start to associate the feelings of the crate with me leaving because they're going to chain those behaviors together, right? Yes. And there are some puppies who will be like, oh, okay, you're leaving. Mm-hmm. No big deal. You know what? See you later. I'm going to take a nap. Right. <laughs> it's been it's been a slice. Yep. Thanks for the entertainment. And there are some puppies that are going to be very, very stressed out about the idea of being alone all day. Right. So when it comes to the actual leaving process, I like to mix things up. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not just going to go put on my coat, put my keys in my pocket, open the door, close the door, walk out. I'm going to leave myself a little five minute window maybe between Mm -hmm. putting my puppy away and actually leaving myself. Mm -hmm. And I might go from the crate to the front door and I might open and close the door. And then I might go back to the kitchen Mm -hmm. and stomp around in the kitchen for a minute. I might go to the front door and then pick up my keys and put them in my pocket and then go to the bathroom before I go, right? I'm going to mix up these little patterns and routines, especially in the early stages, so that my puppy doesn't latch on to any one specific trigger to say, oh, that's going to signify me being alone. Because they will trace that back Mm -hmm. to being alone, being isolated, Mm -hmm. whether it's in the crate or not. There's a lot of dogs will end. Actually, it's it's a much more likely scenario that they end up with separation anxiety or separation related stress if they are left loose or if they're left in a bigger setup than they need. Right. You know, puppies, even though it's counterintuitive for us humans because we want bigger, right? Right. Bigger Mm -hmm. is better. We're waiting Mm -hmm. for the bigger, better deal. But with puppies, a tight little cave is what's going to make them feel more safe. They feel cozy and den-like in there. Yeah, exactly. Whereas in a big crate, they feel like they're out in the open. There's there's no safe place. Yeah, exactly. Crate, pen, like leaving your puppy in a big X pen with a pee pad there and a whole bunch of toys. And with even with the crate in there with the door open, that's going to create a lot more anxiety for your puppy than mm-hmm. leaving them in a nice tight little crate, getting them used to it, of course, before yep. you start leaving them solo in it. But I also like to leave on background noise for them yep. so that they're not triggering on any specific sound in the day. Yes. You know, you hear about dogs in apartments or dogs, on, even dogs in houses, knowing it's four o'clock. 
right? And yep. that's because they listen and they yep. pay attention to the triggers in the environment. Right. Yep. So if all of a sudden there's an increased amount of traffic on your street at mm-hmm. around four o'clock, that's going to be their trigger every day. Yep. If every day the elevator starts, you know, really getting active mm-hmm. and, the, and the dog hears that, that's going to be a trigger. Right. Like yep. all those things are triggers. So I want to leave on some background music. We've had amazing success with the McCann Dogs Music Channel. Yes. It will help to just dampen the noises that are happening around. Um, most of my puppies, I like to cover their crates too. When I want them to just like turn off, go to sleep, relax, mm-hmm. I'll cover the crate, I'll leave on the background noise and that keeps them from going, is that you? Are you coming? What are you doing? Where'd you go? Mm. Where's the person? Right. <laughs> you know, they yeah. just basically, there's there's not those right. triggers out yes. there. So they relax, they go to sleep. It's soothing. Even like for myself sometimes, you know, during the day, I'll, I'll put on some soft music um, and it just, yeah. There you just, go. Do you sleep in the crate? I don't sleep. I don't quite fit. <laughs> <laughs> you just need a bigger crate. Well, it's my couch. My couch is my crate. Okay, so the ca- the crate that we had for Quincy, both of us I could have fit, fit in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm telling you, that thing was huge. I remember when I finally got rid of it. Right. Um. I, we lost Quincy in what? Uh, two thousand and nine. Um. But when we finally got rid of it, it was so huge, and I brought it to McCann's because I gave it to someone here. I can't remember who it was that could use that size mm-hmm. of a crate. But I took a picture of Ty sitting inside the crate, <laughs> and it was just the funniest thing because, right. of course, he was a fairly small dog, and this crate was just immense mm-hmm. for Quincy. So, anyways, it fit the Rottweiler, but uh, definitely was too big. For and it probably toy. opened up a lot more space in your house. Yes. Like, oh, look at yeah, all the room absolutely. I have. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. It was like, oh, my gosh. I didn't even realize I had this whole room in here. I thought this was just a crate. Great. Anyways. And we don't want to make a big deal out of them either. We're not going to go up and say yes. a sad oh, goodbye. So good. Yes. So when we leave our dogs, you know, I just basically, I do the things I need to do and I leave. The last thing I want to do is go up to my puppy and say, yeah. I'm so sorry, I'm leaving you and cuddle them and make a big deal because now I'm getting the puppy all like, yeah. oh, what are they so stressed about? What are they so worried about? And yeah. I leave the dog in a state of anxiety. You know what I want to say about that? What? That's good for the humans. It makes the human feel yes. good to express their sorrow about leaving the dog behind. It is really not good for it's the dog. It's not good for the it's dog. It's actually cruel for the yes. dog because it puts the it puts the puppy in a state of anxiety, as you right. said. And even though it makes us feel better, we're actually creating a problem if that's the scenario. So right. please don't feel bad about the crate. Don't feel bad about leaving. If you do, and you know what? It's natural to feel bad. We're nurturers. We love our puppies and yes. we want to nurture them. But it is definitely not nurturing for them. It is nurturing for you. It's definitely not nurturing for them to make a big deal out of comings and goings because that will add to the stress. So, you know. Nonchalant, very casual comings and goings. Yeah. And I just sort of cover the crate like I would any other time. And actually, that's a good point to bring up as well. If you are only using the crate when you either are putting the puppy to bed for the night or when you are going out, that's going to be a mistake that's going to come back and potentially bite you in Mm -hmm. the butt as well. Make sure you're using the crate when you are home as well as when you're out and about. And I like to use the times for um, creating when I'm home Mm -hmm. to both create longevity in the crate and calmness in Mm -hmm. the crate. So I'll do the setup with the cover and the background music when I want my dog to relax and, you know, be crated and sleep for a couple of hours. There are other times where I just want my puppy to be able to go into the crate and sort of see what's going on in the mm-hmm. house so yeah. that he's comfortable being quiet and, and right. relaxed in the crate when there's action too. Yes. Sometimes one will come before the other mm. depending on the puppy and their own level of confidence in the crate. But I do want to make sure that I get my puppy used to all sorts of different scenarios right. and that they're spending time crated when I'm home as well as when yes. I'm out. And that actually serves us really well because puppies sleep a lot. They do, yes. And yes. they need to sleep a lot. Mm-hmm. We need to give them that opportunity so. And I want my puppy to be flexible around my schedule. Yes. So, you know, when, when my son was young, you know, he'd have friends over and, you know, the puppy would have to go in the crate and, you know, the puppy could definitely hear the kids playing with their Nerf guns and running around. But, you know, the puppy was relaxed in there. I knew the puppy was safe in there. Yeah. I could focus on the, the turmoil that was going on in my recreation room and not worry about <laughs> what the puppy's up to. The turmoil was kids, not puppies. Thank right. goodness. And the f- kept finding little foam Nerf darts everywhere. Would you like to take a question I would. out of our toolbox? <laughs> okay, our first question. Usually people work at least eight hours. That dog will be fine in the crate like that for at least nine. So that's 
more of a statement than a question. Right, yes, yes. But. Well, it depends on the dog and it the does. age of the dog. I would never leave a puppy, ever. Because yeah. there's no way the puppy can hold itself. There's no way a young dog could hold itself. It's true, yeah. I, I would not leave a dog that long in their crate every day. So I would look for a pet sitting service to come in at noon or a neighbor to come in. Uh, maybe there's a reliable high school student that can come in at some point. Yeah. Um, even now, with Honda being elderly, I, you know, I, I think he could hold himself that long, but it's a lot to ask an yeah. elderly dog to do. And so I, even now I make, you know, I, I kind of seven hours is my tops with Honda gotcha. right now, but every dog is different. Yeah, like I'm sure true. your dogs are, are different than Honda. Yeah. So I, that's, that's not ideal. It's, yeah. it's, that's not ideal. It's um, a long time. Definitely for a baby puppy. Like you right. need to make some sort of arrangement for them midday until right. their bladders are fully developed because right. physically it's just not. Yes. And, and not good for them. think of your breed too. If, if I know I'm leaving a dog all the time in a crate like that, you know, I'm going to choose my breed wisely. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. yes. Uh, you know, I might have my heart set on a certain breed, but maybe that's not, you know, that's not, you know, a happy situation for that breed yeah. to be created that long. Yeah. So yeah, think, well, think long and hard about that. And yeah, uh, just know. to add to that a little bit, we've done some episodes on picking the right breed for you, but definitely if you are looking for a dog to be a companion for you when you're home through the week and on the weekends, and you're expecting the dog to spend the majority of their time solo, you're going to need to be very careful about what breeds you do pick because there are... Or mix of breeds. Yeah, yes. yeah, good point. Yes. There's a lot of working dogs that literally that's a nightmare for them. It really is. They're yes. not going to be good weekend warriors. Y y do some research and just make sure that you're picking a dog that has energy and lifestyle to match your lifestyle. Right. And then it's going to be a match made in mm -hmm. heaven. Yeah, you and you, you might find, you might go, you know what, I, I want this, but... I don't have anyone to help me with my puppy. Yeah. Maybe I'll get an adult dog then. Yeah. So maybe I'll go to my local shelter or to a rescue or to a breeder and, you know, explain my situation. Yeah. And they might have like the perfect five-year-old dog that's, yep. well, you know, housebroken, you know, crate trained, you know, and yeah. then it, it's... Retired breeding prospect. Or, right. You know, yes. a lot of the times too, even a little bit younger breeders will sort of grow a puppy on to see what they mature into mm -hmm. if they're going to have good things to offer the breeding program. Right. Yeah. And then if they end up not being what the breeder was hoping for, it'll be it'll be available for purchase. That dog will be available available for purchase and mm -hmm. they might already be house trained and... Right. All you know, the all hard work's done. Things. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I know I got an, a little bit older puppy once and it was so nice because oh. the puppy slept through the night and, you know... A lot of yeah. the basics were done, and I thought, oh, this is way easier than a seven-week-old. <laughs> this is how to shop for a puppy. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I got a big one. Well, that's Ooh. it. And I like the large print. Yes, uh, we're very grateful to our producers yes, because we They both... know we're elderly, and we do <laughs> we do need cheater glasses elderly. now. So we got large, oh large print. Okay. For the elderly dog trainers. <laughs> 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 Can anyone tell me how to train a one-year-old pup to not chew and dig up my whole yard? They seem to do it when I'm not home, so they know it's not behavior I want. Hmm, not sure that that's really... Um, how do I correct this? Thanks. So first off, the first thing I'm going to point out here, they seem to do it when I'm not home, so they know it's not behavior I want. Here's the thing. Dogs do what's rewarding. And dogs avoid doing things that are not rewarding. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that they have a clear understanding of the idea that, for example, digging is not allowed in the yard. Right. So therefore, I am going to do it when you're not watching, but when you're watching, I'm not going to do it. Yeah, they're, dogs don't think like that. No. And no. the reason they're not doing it when you're there is because they're avoiding the aversive that comes along with this situation. Dogs are extremely situational. So if they're digging while you're there, or if they are not digging while you're there, it's because you've probably said to them when you're there, this is not acceptable, and maybe you've corrected that behavior when you're there. But here's the thing. Dogs are also opportunistic. They're scavengers. There's all sorts of traits that come along with dogs. So if it's safe in their mind to dig when you're not there, they're probably going to dig when mm -hmm. you're not there. That's not to say they understand that it is not desirable to dig. Right, yes. So, I mean, and this is, I'm sure even after explaining that, people are still going, huh? 
like scratching their head, but this is the way dogs think. Like this is not, oh, I truly understand that digging is not a desirable function in a human world. That's not how it goes. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. it's, oh, they don't it's understand that these point. are prized roses. Yeah. They, you know, they don't know. It's like, this is just fun to dig. Exactly. Exactly. So here's the thing. If you give your dog the opportunity to go out in the yard and be unsupervised and develop bad habits like digging and chewing up things, et cetera, that is going to drive their behavior and that is going to be the thing that they need to do. So there's a couple of schools of thought here from me. One is if you can avoid the dog learning to do that in the first place, you're going to save yourself a whole lot of time and effort, Mm -hmm. which It sounds like a lot of work to be out there with your dog, but you know what? It's all part of the training process. So if for the first, you know, six to eight months of my dog's life, I'm supervising them when they're in the yard, you know, maybe I'm just watching through the kitchen window once they start to get more mature, but I'm still watching so that as soon as I see my dog starting to dig, I can, you know, bang on the glass to get his attention. You know, maybe I throw open the patio door at that point and say, hey, 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 don't you dig in that yard and then move on from right. there sort of thing. And you want to supervise catch them just as they're starting. Yes. If they've already been digging for 10 minutes and are, you know, halfway yeah. through the yard, you've missed your opportunity. Yeah. Or if they, you've gone to bring them in and there's a hole in the yard. Oh yeah. Yeah. Done the, deal. That's yeah. It's over and done with. You missed your opportunity. Yes, absolutely. And what's really important in this, this supervision and like heavy duty feedback for the dog for the first six to eight months is then you create a situation where your dog goes, okay, right. I know digging is off limits. You know, Mm -hmm. I've not gotten value in my life for digging. I've gotten scolded for digging. So therefore digging is not rewarding for me anymore. Mm -hmm. Not going to dig. Right. right? So that's sort of a simplification of getting in front of the problem. Now, the other school of thought is if you have a problem already, which of course, if you have a problem already, now you're definitely going to make some need to make some changes in order to fix this problem. So to teach these dogs to stop digging in your yard, they can no longer have any unsupervised time out because it's a very addictive habit. It is. And that's exactly it. It's a habit. Mm -hmm. We have created a habit in the dog that the dog goes outside and self satisfies by digging. Right. So now what I need to do is remember, first of all, that it takes an average of six weeks to break a habit. So I need to put an X on the calendar six weeks from today where this is the time where now I'm going to start testing whether or not my lessons on not digging have gotten through to the dog. So I'm going to put that X on the calendar and I'm going to make sure that I stick to supervising, stopping immediately, redirecting behavior, et cetera, Mm -hmm. anytime my dog starts digging, which means I have to be there. Right. If I'm not there, that habit will continue to get perpetuated. And it's like putting money in the bank, Mm -hmm. right? It's building the behavior back up again. So I need to be there for those six weeks. I need to watch. I need to make sure I'm stopping it in its tracks every time. Mm -hmm. I need to redirect the behavior. I need to deal with it. Right. And then after six weeks, now maybe I'm going to remove myself from the picture. I'm going to send my dog out in the yard, but I'm still watching. You know, is he going to make good choices? Right. Maybe I give him something to occupy himself. I don't like putting in dig boxes. I uh, Lots of people do this. Mm-hmm. I'm not a fan of it. I, I, dogs don't need to dig. No. We can give them outlets if we want to, or we can actually fix the behavior yes. and make sure that they understand it's not an acceptable thing to dig up my yard, you know? And I would say, even if I do give my dog a dig box to fulfill that need, I'm still going to have to work through making sure he understands that digging in the rest of the yard is not acceptable. So, um, yeah little bit of work yeah for so sure no quick fix for digging it it requires effort on our yeah, part absolutely and the quickest fix truly is yes. if you can stop it before it starts right you see that first little sign that your puppy is digging mm-hmm. addressing it at that point because you're there and you're supervising and you can is going to save you a whole lot of frustration right yes a whole lot of frustration mm-hmm. all right okay questions for you Okay, our can next. toolbox filled with questions. Can you explain why not to reward peeing outside with food? Ooh, oh, see? we already did. Here's the question. We already did. <laughs> we got that one. Do you want to take the okay, last one? Okay, then the last question. <laughs> we're we're uh, on a roll. Predictive, yes. Uh-huh. Okay. Is it safe to leave a Kong or a chew boy, chew boy, a chew bone <laughs> in their crate for two to four hours when you're not home watching them? It is. It we is. We already answered that. Too. It is as long as it's a 
an appropriate chew bone. You got it. Yes, because yep. chew bone encompass, encompasses quite a few different types of bones. Chew so bone. yes. we want it to be like a, a good quality nylon bone that your puppy already has a history with. Yeah. So when I purchase a new bone or toy for my dogs, I give it to them and then I watch. And I'm watching to see, can they nibble bits off it? Does yeah. it crack? Does it splinter? If it does, then, you know, it goes in the garbage. Exactly. So this is a bone that I leave in there that they've played with many, many times. And I know it's not going to give us any issues. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yes. So definitely you can leave a toy in there with them. And, and, and don't overwhelm them with toys too. I usually leave one toy in yeah. there. Yeah. You know what? I think that's important for outside of the crate as well. Because yes. a lot of the times people put, they think more is better. And of course, we want to spoil our puppies. We love our puppies. So we I want know, them yes. to have a million toys, but only give them one at a time. Right, yes. And the reason for that is that it, it gets really confusing when mm -hmm. there's 10 or 15 toys on the ground. First off, they lose their value really quickly right. when there's an excess of them. Mm -hmm. But when it is something that is always available for your puppy, it's going to lose its value as well. But it also skews the line for your puppy between what's theirs to chew and what's not. Right. You know, what's yes. the difference in your puppy's mind between that soft chew mm -hmm. toy and the running shoe? Right, yes. Right? So too many options causes confusion. It's like exactly. going to the restaurant yes. when you're starving and trying to order off a six-page menu. Right, yes. You know, it's a lot. Right, so yes. And <laughs> one toy, and that'll be simple for them. And you right. can rotate and that And rotate them. Out. That's yeah. what I was going to say. Like right now, Honda, has two toys on the ground and I have like I must have a thousand toys in a bag and <laughs> about every two or three days I go and I change over his toys so I reach deep into the bag and I'll pull out something different that he hasn't seen you know because I have so many toys it might be months <laughs> and I pull it out oh and Honda's like oh brand new toy oh so you know for two or three days he thinks those two toys are the best and then I put them away and we bring out a couple more that I he hasn't seen else. and uh yeah it's like Christmas every, yeah. every couple of days for him love that and how mm -hmm. exciting for him so Great. there you go that yeah. sounds like a lot more fun yes. for now the people dog probably, than having 15 toys out on the ground yes at the same so time. yeah I don't recommend having a thousand toys but <laughs> When, once your dog is 14 and a half, you have accumulated yes. a lot of toys. It is true. <laughs> well, and how many dogs have you had, right? That's like, I'm true. sure you have some well, toys a lot that of, go back to... Yes. Some of my toys go way, <laughs> like, are going 20 years back. Some of the, yeah. the nylon bones that, that we have. I can tell by the stench of them uh, that my toys are really old. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did, I did have a toy purge. <laughs> That's I, not I too long ago, I did stink. go have a, a, a toy purge. I thought, you know what? These ones have seen better days <laughs> or these are, like... Maybe I should put them in an antique museum. <laughs> oh my God. Right. Yes. Yeah, so. The old dog toy museum. Right. I love it. That's our next adventure. <laughs> and on that note, I'm Instructor Shannon. Instructor Swanee. Happy training. The McCann Dogs Podcast is brought to you by McCann Professional Dog Trainers. We help dog owners to have a well behaved, four legged family member. Please give us a call at 905 659 1888 or visit us at mccandogs.com. Happy training.